Good morning. A quorum being present of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Afghanistan and Pakistan Resourcing the Civilian Surge will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements. Without objection so ordered, I ask unanimous consent that formal written testimony from Dr. Patrick Cronin of National Defense University be accepted for the record. Without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record and without objection so ordered. Well, I want to thank all of our panel for being here with us this morning. Uh, the, today, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs will explore the civilian surge component of the President's new strategy for Afghanistan and Pakistan. The President has said that a campaign against extremism will not succeed with bullets and bombs alone. As such, a critical part of the Administration's new strategy for the region is to significantly increase civilian staffing. The plan to surge upwards of 500 civilians over a short time horizon into the Afghanistan and Pakistan centers uh, it enters uncharted waters for civilian agencies such as the United States Department of Agriculture, the State Department, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. The last time economists, city managers, agronomists, law advisors, and accountants were recruited and deployed en masse to a combat theater goes back at least four decades, the United States support for pacification programs during the Vietnam War era. This hearing examines what we have learned from more recent civilian deployments in post-conflict states like Iraq and failed states like Sudan. We have gathered the, this experienced panel of administration officials to share with us their plans to recruit, train, and deploy this new cadre of civilians. We are counting on them to ensure that the best trained staff will be deployed to today's most challenging foreign theater, Afghanistan and Pakistan. As a subcommittee with interagency jurisdiction, we are especially interested in the extent of collaborative planning among the civilian agencies to support a whole-of-government approach to reconstruction and development. The subcommittee is also keenly interested in how the civilian agencies are coordinating with the Department of Defense on pre-deployment training so that we're using existing resources and not reinventing courses, curricular, and other educational materials for our civilian surge recruits. Some observers of recruitment programs have said that finding additional qualified civilians has been hampered by the ongoing heavy demand in Iraq for civilian and military construction experts. In their view, those not working in Iraq are already in Afghanistan. As such, there is a risk that new applicants responding to today's personnel recruitment ads will not have the requisite skills and or the overseas experience to hit the ground running. If this is accurate, civilians recruited for the surge will need considerable training and country familiarization before deploying if they are to be effective upon arrival. A scarcity of qualified civilians has led to numerous media reports suggesting that the Department of Defense, rather than the civilian agencies, is likely to fill most of the billets. Another issue that surge civilians will face in country is how well they are integrated within and coordinated with the military. Many surge recruits will likely be assigned to provincial reconstruction teams led by military officers. The PRTs will likely have a total of three or four diplomacy, reconstruction, and aid development subject matter experts from USAID, the Department of State, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Justice. The surge civilians working for ministries in Kabul or the provinces will also need to coordinate with the military to avoid duplication of effort and to strengthen local capabilities. While the military has worked hard to establish and implement a unified military command, it seems desirable to have an analogous unified civilian command. And ultimately, both commands will need to be fully integrated to achieve long-lasting positive results. Frankly, the call for a civilian surge in Afghanistan is not new. In late 2008, predating the new Afghanistan-Pakistan strategy, the U.S. Embassy in Kabul requested a major increase in government civilians in such areas as governance, rule of law, development and diplomacy to be deployed at provincial and district levels. Regrettably, we are told that this request was not fulfilled. The State Department's Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, created in 2004, was chartered to lead U.S. efforts to respond to crisis in failing, failed, and post-conflict situations like the present one in Afghanistan. It is not clear to me what role SCRS can or will play in Afghanistan and Pakistan at this critical moment. We hope to have that addressed this morning. I'm pleased to have with us today administration officials from the State Department, USAID, USDA, and the Department of Defense. We want to know how you are, plan how you are planning to staff the Afghanistan-Pakistan civilian surge in regard to recruitment, training, deployment, and retention. 
We want to know what lessons you've learned in Iraq and elsewhere in terms of utilizing civilians in complex operations. And additionally, the subcommittee would like to hear how to best expand and institutionalize a ready-to-deploy civilian workforce that keeps in step with increasing security challenges from weak and failed states. I look forward to hearing how each of your agencies intends to translate the President's strategy into operational reality. And with that, I defer to Mr. Flake for his opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have much to add. I think the Chairman said it very well. Uh, we're looking to see some, some uh, detail uh, and uh, to see how you plan to implement it. Uh, I think all of us recognize uh, the need for this kind of civilian surge. It's just uh, uh, we don't have uh, many details about how it's going to be carried out. And, and obviously, as the Chairman mentioned, to see what lessons have been learned uh, in Iraq and, and already in Afghanistan. I think those of us who have traveled to Afghanistan have seen the need uh, for better coordination uh, with military counterparts and the civilians that are there. And uh, I'm anxious to hear how you plan to do that. So with that, uh, thank you all, and I look forward to the testimony. Thank you, Mr. Flake. The subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. Let me introduce them uh, briefly, if I might. Uh, Mr. Paul W. Jones currently serves as the Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. A member of the Senior Foreign Service, Mr. Jones previously served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the United States Embassies in the Philippines and in Macedonia. Mr. Jones has also served as Director of the Executive Secretariat Staff, supporting the Secretary of State and Director of the Office of South Central Europe, responsible for U.S. policy in the Balkans. Mr. Jones holds a B.A. from Cornell University, an M.P.A. from the University of Virginia, and an M.A. from the Naval War College. Welcome, Mr. Jones. Mr. David Sedney currently serves as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. Most recently, Mr. Sedney was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, and prior to that served as Deputy Chief of Mission to the United States Embassy in Beijing. After reopening the U.S. Embassy in Kabul in 2002, Mr. Sedney served there as Deputy Chief of Mission, a post that he again served in from 2003 to 2004. He later served as Director for Afghanistan at the National Security Council. Mr. Sedney holds a B.A. from Princeton University and a J.D. from Suffolk University Law School. A good school, I might add. <laughs> Mr. James Beaver currently serves as Director of the Afghanistan-Pakistan Task Force at the United States Agency for International Development, where he oversees more than $4 billion in U.S. assistance to Afghanistan and Pakistan. A member of the Senior Foreign Service, Mr. Beaver previously served as Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Middle East, providing leadership for $2.5 billion in U.S. assistance to the Middle East and North Africa. Mr. Beaver holds a B.A. from Cornell University and an M.S. from Georgetown University. Mr. Michael Mishner currently serves as the Administrator for the Foreign Agricultural Service at the United States Department of Agriculture. Prior to that, he served as a Senior Democracy and Governance, Governance Advisor and lead, lead planning, planning Officer for the State Department's Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. Mr. Mishner also previously worked for the State Department as the lead Iraq Policy Officer for Democracy and Human Rights Assistance Programs. Mr. Mishner holds a BA from the University of Maryland. Ambassador John E. Herbst currently serves as the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization at the United States Department of State. A member of the Senior Foreign Service, Ambassador Herbst previously served as U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine and Uzbekistan and has held other postings in Jerusalem, Moscow, and Riyadh. Ambassador Herbst holds a B.S. from Georgetown University and a Master of Law and Diplomacy from the Fletcher School of Tufts University. I want to thank all of you for making yourselves available today. It's practice of this subcommittee to have members uh, and the panel sworn in before they testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, the record will reflect that all of the members of the panel uh, answered in the affirmative. In your written uh, comments, which you were kind enough to submit in advance to the panel, will already be on record and accepted as that. So we ask you to, to uh, please give us a statement of five minutes or less, if you can. And from that, we'll ask some questions and uh, proceed accordingly. So Mr. Jones, if you'd be kind enough to, to begin. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman Tierney and uh, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, for inviting me here today. It's a real privilege to appear before you. Ambassador Holbrook and his interagency team are committed to working closely with Congress as we implement a new strategy for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and we appreciate the deep interest and knowledge uh, among the members of this subcommittee. Uh, congressional support for the President's strategy and, and the resources needed to implement it are critical to our success, and, and we look forward to continuing this fruitful dialogue. 
I'm here today to discuss the significant civilian increase for, for particularly for Afghanistan that the President announced in late March. At that time, he noted that to, that quote, to advance security, opportunity, and justice, not just in Kabul, but from the bottom up in the provinces, we need agricultural specialists and educators, engineers and lawyers, unquote. We are working with 10 other U.S. government departments and agencies to identify and deploy civilian personnel to work alongside not only U.S. military personnel, uh, but also our Afghan and international partners. This civilian increase is one of several significant elements of the administration's new strategy, and it underscores our conviction that, to a, that achieving counterinsurgency objectives in Afghanistan and Pakistan will require enhanced civilian military coordination at all levels. You have the details of, of the plan in my written statement, but let me highlight just a couple of key components. U.S. civilians will help build Afghan government capacity in the most dangerous, insurgent-afflicted parts of the country, and will also expand programs to create jobs and build local economies. The U.S. Embassy and U.S. Forces Afghanistan, in coordination with the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, determined that approximately 420 more U.S. civilian specialists were needed in specific locations between July 2009 and March 2010 to work closely with our military to focus on the hold and build phases in, the contest in contested parts of the country. The new personnel will also have a multiply multiplier effect as they hire additional Afghan staff and expand NGO partnerships. A joint U.S. Embassy, U.S. Forces Afghanistan team is constantly reevaluating the civilian increase, and if more civilian capacity is required, we will provide it. We adopted a whole of government approach to meet the civilian requirements. Experts from the Department of State, USAID, and the Department of Agriculture constitute the core of the civilian teams that will deploy outside Kabul to the provinces and districts with our military. Personnel from the State Department's Office of Reconstruction and Stabilization are helping to integrate civilian and military activities, and we expect they will also fill some civilian increased priorities in the field. Despite the risks of, of deploying an, to an active conflict zone, I'm pleased to report that there has been a tremendous response to the call to duty. As a result, we are on track and on schedule to staff the entire civilian increase with highly qualified state USAID and USDA permanent and temporary hire personnel in the field. A new service recognition package will provide those serving in Afghanistan with the same benefits as those serving in Iraq. Many applicants have prior experience in Afghanistan or Iraq and are eager to once again serve on the front lines. If staffing gaps develop, we will immediately turn to other hiring streams including the Department of Defense's Civilian Expeditionary Workforce, and if needed, examine the possibility of utilizing military reservists in civilian attire and under Chief of Mission Authority. To ensure the civilians are fully prepared, we are upgrading an integrated civilian military training program that all civilians will attend. To ensure that civilians are well-led and coordinated, we are upgrading our leadership at Embassy Kabul and in the field. Four U.S. ambassadors will lead civilian efforts at our embassy in Kabul and coordinate directly with our military. To illustrate how the civilian increase will work, let me cite, give it as an example, one, just one Afghan province. Uh, in Helmand province in the south, where significant new U.S. military personnel will deploy, we currently have one State Department representative, one USAID development expert, and three Afghan staff on the British-led Provisional Reconstruction Team located in the capital. The civilian increase will add 11 additional State Department representatives, four USAID development experts, one, one USDA agricultural specialist, and six Afghan staff. They will work with the new military units to establish three new district support teams. At the same time, USAID's implementing partner staff will increase from approximately 30 to 35 international personnel and from approximately 400 to 450 Afghan specialists working with, for NGOs which are funded by U.S. government development projects. This influx of additional U.S. and Afghan civilian personnel will add significantly to our ability to build local Afghan government capacity and oversee assistance projects while teaming up with military colleagues to stabilize this conflicted province. 
We know from experience in Afghanistan and, in Iraq, and Iraq that lack of security can inhibit civilian effectiveness by limiting the ability of civilians to travel outside of military bases. We very much welcome General Petraeus's strong commitment to ensure maximum freedom of movement for civilians, and we will work closely with his team to make that operational. Civilian field presence is, of course, not simply a U.S. job. Our coalition partners are playing an important role. Some, like Canada and the United Kingdom, have had significant civilian field presence in southern Afghanistan for some time. We encourage our partners to aug augment their civilian field footprint and are actively coordinating in, in Kabul through, with the help of the, uh, the United Nations. Significantly, the, I might add, the, the, that subject was uh, uh, explored among the special representatives that just met in Istanbul. Ambassador Holbrook and his colleagues were um, uh, talking about their very, very subject um, yesterday. Significantly, the Afghan government recently presented a plan for some 650 international and Afghan technical experts. We're discussing actively with the Afghans and our partners how much of that need is being met by planned civilian increases and what more maybe need to be done. Finally, I would like to cite the important work of the Special Re uh, Inspector for Afghanistan Reconstruction, SIGAR. Ambassador Holbrook and his team strongly support the role of General Fields in closely monitoring the disbursement of assistance. The Afghan government has specifically asked SIGAR to advance its own anti-corruption efforts. SIGAR is Congress's representative on the ground, and we would like to see them deployed in every province. We value SIGAR and respect their independence to the extent that Congress is willing to expand its mandate and responsibilities, Ambassador Holbrook has made clear, we would very strongly support that. Thank you again for this opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Jones. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. Sidney. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you and the, and the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify, and I, I can confirm that this is the first time uh, that I've appeared before Congress uh, to a fellow Suffolk University uh, alumni. Uh, um, the uh, m uh, appearance here uh, with my interagency colleagues uh, is, uh, I think, a very accurate reflection of exactly what uh, my colleague Mr. Jones said about the interagency approach here. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, in this uh, effort, uh, civilian effort is playing very much a, a supporting role. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the, the strategic review that the, president, uh, <coughs> that the President ordered and that the administration carried out uh, came to the conclusion after extensive consultation, I might uh, stress, uh, with our allies and friends and looking at the uh, experiences not just in Afghanistan but also in Iraq, uh, the, uh, uh, the importance of a need for expanded civilian presence. Uh, we are currently implementing, uh, as uh, Mr. Jones said, uh, the, a request uh, for over 400. Uh, General Petraeus has uh, made very clear, he has pledged uh, that uh, we will, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, CENTCOM, the U.S. forces on the ground, uh, will provide uh, the necessary support for additional civilians to include uh, the security issue that uh, Mr. Jones mentioned, as well as other areas of support that are necessary. Uh, if there are additional personnel beyond uh, the, the uh, current request, we will be prepared to support those as well. Uh, if, uh, and it hasn't happened yet, but if uh, the uh, State Department were to ask us for additional help, as, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Jones said, that the Department is prepared to respond. Uh, that request hasn't happened yet, uh, and, uh, but if it does happen, we are prepared to respond. On uh, May 11th, uh, Secretary Gates signed a memorandum uh, directing the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness to identify civilian employees capable of deploying in Afghanistan in support of U.S. government initiatives. Uh, this uh, initiative is to identify potential candidates if the, a request is made. But I want to, to, uh, to again say we are supporting the State Department in this. The Defense Department is not in the lead. There is no, uh, uh, there is no plan for the Department of Defense to take over uh, this, uh, this activity. Uh, we are in support of the, uh, of the Department of State. Uh, uh, the planning to integrate uh, the civilian military effort that you mentioned in your statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is very much underway. Uh, the uh, integrated civil military action group at the embassy uh, and the interagency team, which uh, includes uh, the U.S. forces Afghanistan as an integral part, uh, is coordinating our lines of effort in this area. Uh, we are, of course, continually reviewing 
uh, how to do this better, uh, how to make sure that we uh, are able to carry out the requirements of the of the president's uh, of the president's policy. Uh, we will not get everything right at the beginning. I'm sure we will have to uh, just to uh, review how things are going, and if there are areas where we need to make improvements, we will. Uh, but I would say that I'm given the the, the level of uh, interagency cooperation here, the level of interagency attention to this, uh, I'm very optimistic uh, that we will uh, be able to succeed. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're ready to, to, for any questions you may have later. Thank you very much, Your testimony, Mr. Beaver. Thank you very much, Chairman Tierney and Ranking Member Flake and other members of the committee. I'd like to start, if I could, with a short little story of the time when David Sedney and I served together in Afghanistan five to six years ago. We had the task uh, of rebuilding the Kabul-Kandahar Highway through an extremely dangerous part of Afghanistan at the time. I was invited to have, uh, uh, this was in Zabul province in the southeast. Um, uh, we were invited to lunch with the governor at the time in Zabul province. Um, uh, he was later assassinated, sadly, but uh, at the end of this lunch, which, which was with tribal leaders, as I was leaving with my convoy, one of the large uh, uh, Pashtun uh, tribal uh, leaders came up to me and pulled my arm and reached out and pointed and to my watch and said, remember one thing, you Americans have all the watches, Taliban have all the time. That made a very lasting impression on me. It was, in fact, an epiphany in my own career because I was eligible to retire at that time. And I thought, no, this struggle is too important for all of us. And this is a long struggle and one that requires input on the development side as well to help evolve people's minds and attitudes. As a result, uh, here we are a number of years later, USAID still takes Afghanistan and Pakistan extremely seriously. We take the staffing up of our involvement very seriously. We uh, cooperate very actively with the members here at this table, interagency, and at the National Security Council. We look forward to a new partnership with Michael Michener and the Foreign Agriculture Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And we have formed a whole of agency task force at USAID since Thanksgiving to oversee a combined Afghanistan-Pakistan effort within AID. We meet at the assistant administrator level every week with our administrator, our acting administrator, to review staffing progress, the progress on buildings, on security, and everything else we need. Second, <clears throat> continued needs. We have the continued need for support of in for incentives to allow our people to be the most effective on the ground and to stay even longer at post, because as you know, most assignments are one year in duration. Uh, we need secure and timely mobility on the ground and in the air in Afghanistan, especially uh, in cooperation with our PRTs, our military and state colleagues. We need the closest of coordination with U.S. military, NATO, ISAF military, and with State Department. We have that, and we are uh, continuing to work on that through coordination mechanisms, which we can talk about later. That goes all the way from training to implementation and planning. We need closer cooperation with the, our fellow donors, not just UNAMA, but especially, I think, the bilateral donors such as the Dutch, the British, and the Canadians who operate in the south, in uh, Helmand and in Orizgan and in Kandahar provinces. And we have begun uh, in earnest discussions with them about how to coordinate better at all levels of our organizations in, in all these countries. We need more resourceful monitoring mechanisms on the ground, creative, flexible, and trustworthy, not only Foreign Service Nationals, but also other additional third-party mechanisms and technologically creative mechanisms to oversee what we're doing. On, on oversight, we value, as Paul Jones just said, um, having uh, the continued partnership of the Inspector General for AID, the General Accounting Office, and the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, General Fields, uh, in Afghanistan in particular in the latter case. What we do urge is that all of them work in close synchrony and harmony in sequencing the timing of their audit work and their investigation work to get the job done to protect our people's money. Uh, we can't be at all places at all times, and uh, our Inspectors General and others are very good at, at assisting us in this, but we, we have to be careful 
that um, our already strained staff are not overwhelmed um, uh, as a result. Uh, <clears throat> in that regard, I would like to just say that we've worked very closely with Stuart Bowen and the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. We've invited Stuart Bowen, Ginger, his deputy, uh, Major uh, General Fields, the General Accounting Office, RIG, and others to meet with our task force at AID. They've done that together. They've done it individually. Uh, we have made the basically required reading of this book to everyone we're sending out to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, one of the lessons in here, for example, has to do with lessons learned from Iraq. Um, uh, uh, hard lessons, the Iraq reconstruction experience, is uh, the importance of listening at the local level and developing from the bottoms up. And that's a new approach for us in Afghanistan. Uh, I'll close by saying uh, two things. One is we uh, appreciate Congress's continuing support for AID's development leadership initiative. This is our uh, initiative to double the number of AID foreign service officers over the next couple of years so that when David Seti and I sit down again together five or six years from now, we'll have more uh, AID officers available to serve in these kinds of places, whatever situation we're in five or six years from now. And on that, I would like to introduce three of our Americans behind me who are currently serving or about to go out to theater. Uh, one is James Bearscheid, who's, a, if you could stand up, James. Uh, he is executive officer, currently serving in Kabul. He's been there almost a year. He hails from Minnesota. The other is uh, Brian Kurtz, if you could stand, Brian. Brian is an example of a, a Foreign Service officer recently retired who's agreed to re-up and come back and serve us deploying out to Afghanistan in the, one of the PRTs from Chappaqua, New York. And uh, Gene Gibson, who is um, a democracy governance officer currently serving in Islamabad for about seven months, hails from Florida. So. Uh, very proud of these officers. Thank you, sir. Well, you, you should be, Mr. Beaver. I want to thank you for bringing these officers with you here today. And just to briefly address the three of you, well, we all understand and appreciate your service and how critical and important it is every bit as much as the men and women that are in uniform uh, with armor, with helmets, with guns, things that you don't have. Uh, and I think that the American public sometimes doesn't hear about the risk that you take, the separation from family, and, uh, and just how involved your commitment is. So if I know I speak for all of my, uh, my fellow panelists up here, uh, we thank you, we pay tribute to what you do, and uh, it is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Mishner. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am pleased to appear before you today. Um, agriculture plays a critical role in the economy and lives of the people of, of Afghanistan and Pakistan. With the agricultural expertise we bring, USDA is committed to supporting President Obama's efforts to increase governmental effectiveness, and enhance economic capacity in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Agriculture will play a pivotal role in implementing the President's counterinsurgency strategy, and USDA is prepared to significantly increase the number of highly skilled agricultural experts serving on provincial reconstruction teams and working at regional and national levels in Afghanistan. I recently traveled to Afghanistan and Pakistan at the behest of Special Representative Holbrook to explore additional ways USDA, USDA can contribute to this effort. Since 2003, over 50 USDA volunteers have served in Afghanistan. USDA PRT members offer expertise in agricultural extension and education, crop production, plant protection, animal health and livestock management, agricultural marketing, irrigation, and natural resources management. They build the capacity of provincial level host country nationals to enable them to manage their own agricultural reconstruction and development. Working at the ministries of agriculture and education, they strengthen the effectiveness of the government. I would like to provide two examples of the work carried out by USDA experts serving on PRTs in Afghanistan. A farm service agency employee from Nevada worked with his Afghan counterparts to install six windmill-powered water pumps. These pumps revitalized a centuries-old irrigation system in the south of Afghanistan that now provides water to livestock, vegetable crops, and fruit trees, replacing the poppies which thrive in dry, rocky soil. Another USDA employee from the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Maryland worked with his Afghan counterparts to rebuild the nation's only functioning soil testing laboratory at the Agricultural University in Nangarhar province. Our advisors display a great deal of satisfaction in their work. Nearly all have helped to recruit other employees to serve on PRTs. Over a dozen USDA advisors have volunteered for extended or additional tours. 
there remains a high amount of interest and enthusiasm in the department as we receive about four applications for each vacancy on a PRT. The department stands behind those who volunteer. We provide incentives and benefits based on those provided by the U.S. Department of State and USAID. PRT advisors undergo three weeks of pre-deployment training at U.S. Army Camp Atterbury in uh, Indiana. This training covers medical combat life-saving, force protection, military civilian coordination, mentoring and partnering with the government of Afghanistan, and general simulation exercises. USDA also provides a Washington-based orientation program for new advisors. Our lessons learned are reflected in standard operating procedures and PRT handbooks that employees use throughout their service. The new advisors also undergo an intensive orientation program upon arrival in Afghanistan. Our program managers in Washington are in frequent contact with the advisors to help with technical issues, provide support with adjustment issues, or just to let them know that their sacrifices and hard work are appreciated. During service, the USDA advisors receive medical care through the State Department Medical Program or from the Department of Defense, depending upon location, timing, and the critical nature of the need. We facilitate communication with the families of the advisors and provide evacuation in case of critical family emergencies. A USDA PRT liaison based in U.S. Embassy in Kabul provides overall management of the program in country. The liaison works closely with counterparts in other civilian and military agencies and ensures smooth interagency coordination for planning and program operations. After serving in PRTs, employees return to their home agencies and the position they held prior to their assignment. In addition to PRT experts, USDA advisors have provided technical assistance to Afghanistan's ministries of agriculture and higher education. Their efforts include providing oversight for about $16 million under our Food for Progress program that was used to construct provincial agricultural extension offices and teaching laboratories in Kabul University. During the recent trilateral meetings, USDA made three commitments to further support our counterinsurgency efforts in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We committed to form working groups in the areas of food security, trade corridors, and water management and watershed rehabilitation. We also committed to increase our Food for Progress programs for both countries. Finally, we committed to expand the training under our Cochrane Fellowship, Borlaug Fellowship, and faculty exchange programs. USDA is prepared to provide a sustained level of skilled and highly motivated experts on PRTs and in government ministries in Afghanistan. Congressional support for the administration's budget and supplemental appropriations is critical to ensure we can effectively stand up the civilian side of the counterinsurgency strategy. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I, I couldn't help but keep watching you look over at that light like you thought the flow was going to go out from underneath <laughs> you if we got the red. Uh, Ambassador, I assure you it won't happen as it, as it didn't <laughs> It's my first time, Mr. Room. Chairman. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You will recognize, sir. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm Ranking Member Flank, uh, members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. In today's tightly interconnected world, there's a growing challenge posed by failed or failing states and ungoverned spaces. Such areas can become breeding grounds for terrorism, weapons proliferation, narco trafficking, piracy. Our national interests. The steps to successfully meet this challenge on the civilian side are not unlike how the military prepares. We need to build the necessary human capacity. We need to develop planning and management systems. We need to train our experts and equip them with the necessary skills for the situations they'll encounter. We need to develop teams, and we need to repeatedly exercise those teams to make sure they're ready for the challenge at hand. At the center of this development of this preparation is the development of a whole of government civilian response capability the Civilian Response Corps, the CRC. As we conceive it, the CRC is to be composed of three components, an active component of 250 full-time first responders from across eight civilian federal departments and agencies, a standby component of 2,000 across those same eight agencies, and a 2,000 member reserve component drawn from the private sector, state, and local government. To date, $140 million has been appropriated to establish, train, and equip a 250-member active component, and a 1,000-member standby component. The first fund, $65 million, came to us about seven months ago. The, the remaining funds, $75 million, were appropriated two months ago in the omnibus bill. 
In the 2010 budget, President Obama has requested for the Civilian Stabilization Initiative $323 million to allow all three of the CRC components to be realized as intended and needed. My office, the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization, or SCRS, operates under the Reconstruction and Stabilization Civilian Management Act of 2008, which calls on the civilian elements of the federal government to work together to promote the security of the U.S. through improved coordination, planning, and implementation. The job of SCRS is to support the Secretary of State leading the way on dealing with reconstruction and stabilization crises. The Civilian Stabilization Initiative is the critical first step to ensure we have the right people with the right skills at the right time. However, making sure that these experts are doing the right things on the ground according to one strategic plan with full synchronization between civilians and military continues to be the most complex and challenging task for SCRS. But the benefits of undertaking this challenge are worthwhile as demonstrated by SCRS's thus far still limited work in Afghanistan. Over 30 of our initial first responders and planners that make up our new expeditionary capability have served in Afghanistan in the last two years. And they have piloted a range of new platforms, plans, and integration efforts that will now set the stage for successful civilian increase. Here are a few highlights of our work to date in Afghanistan. Our civilian responders pioneered the design and management of the Integrated Civilian Military Action Group, the ICMAG, at Embassy Kabul, which is at the forefront of civilian military integration in Kabul, ensuring that civilian and military are planning together and assessing and acting together at all levels of the mission. We've also developed a planning system now in use by all of the American PRTs and our new military and civilian elements across Afghanistan to ensure that civilian military plans are put together and executed properly. Thanks to these efforts, there are now plans for civil operations at each American PRT and at Regional Command East. We've also developed pre-deployment training for civilian and military personnel deploying to Afghanistan so they can hit together, they can work as a team once they hit the ground in Afghanistan. We've initiated the first civilian teams at U.S. task forces that will now be the platform for the upcoming civilian increase. We've developed a new integrated performance measurement system for subnational levels, which is currently being piloted. And we have developed new ideas such as the models for district teams that would operate under provincial reconstruction teams. And under Ambassador Holbrook's direction, we have put together and are leading the interagency Afghan election support team to provide assistance to Embassy Kabul as it prepares for the upcoming presidential and provincial council elections. Additional details on all of these items are in my prepared statement. With the funds that have been appropriated to date, we have hired and identified 338 members of the Civilian Response Corps. And we've, we began last week to train those first members. By the summer, we should be in a position to deploy our first members to Afghanistan as part of the ramp up. By the fall, we, we should be in a position to deploy dozens of CRC members to Afghanistan or other places. As Afghanistan so clearly demonstrates, Failing states and ungoverned spaces can quickly spawn threats to the security of our nation, its citizens, and our interests, and our allies and partners. Building the U.S. planning and operations capacity embodied in the Civilian Stabilization Initiative and the Civilian Response Corps will ensure that we are prepared in the future for the challenges that are coming our way. In the end, this effort will depend on a strong, effective U.S. civilian response capacity. With this, we will ultimately spend less money and lose fewer lives in dealing with the challenge of failed and failing states. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank all of you for your testimony. I think it's been a good platform for us to uh, start some questions on that. And I'll uh, begin the five-minute questioning sessions if I might, but uh, one general question for each of you. Uh, have you all brought in the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction into the planning stages uh, on this? Is, uh, has his office been brought in along with any other Inspector General so that they know in advance exactly what it is that you are planning so that they can set up their structure uh, to better oversee this throughout. Now, Mr. Beaver, you addressed that a little bit in your remarks, but Mr. Jones, if I start left to right, you give us any information you have on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, indeed, we, we, have, we meet frequently with uh, uh, General Field and his, and his team, both uh, in Washington and in the field. Um, uh, and I think he is yeah, completely aware of our civilian increase plans. Um, I, I'm personally not so familiar with exactly how his team and ours have synced up on that, um, but they are, uh, but his team is a growing presence in, in Kabul and, and in Afghanistan, and we're very supportive of that. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sidney. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I said, we're in support on this, so we've, we've had no direct contact with the Inspector General on this issue. Okay. Mr. Beaver, you reiterate what you said earlier, yeah, I suppose. Uh, in terms of our own Inspector General for AID, uh, the Deputy Inspector General of the agency sits on our Afghan-Pakistan task force that meets every Friday morning at 10 o'clock, sir. And so he's there all the time, and we welcome his presence as our in-house physician, if you will. And uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, we look forward to our IG uh, residing there as well in presence. And that's a good lesson learned from Iraq, sir, uh, that concurrent audit. As for the uh, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, we've met with uh, General Fields and his staff three times here in Washington, had to meet our administra acting administrator, and our people in Kabul meet regularly with his staff. Thank you. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, our planning for the increase in USDA personnel in Afghanistan is just now getting underway, so we have not yet been in touch to coordinate with the Special Inspector General, but we will be. You do intend to do that? We do intend to do we that. We appreciate yes, that. Thank you. Ambassador? Oh, we have been in touch with the Inspector General. Okay. Thank you. Now, Ambassador, while I have you uh, for a second, do you uh, have any uh, numbers where you anticipate on uh, moving through your program and out into the field on an annual basis? Now that you've got some resources finally uh, allocated to you, I know you're just ramping up uh, probably this year, probably when you first started going within the last couple of months. Do you have a plan of, of how many you expect to pass through the program and be available for deployment on, on, a, on a periodic basis? Yes. Uh, we anticipate that by the fall uh, we will have um, over 150, actually 250 members of the Civilian Response Corps, not just tired, and, but trained and equipped and ready to go. Uh, by the end of the first quarter of next year, by March 31, we would expect all 600 of the CRC that we were building with the money we received last fall to be ready for deployment. And beyond that, we, we received additional appropriations a couple of months ago. We would expect within, um, by early or mid-2011, to have the 1,250 members that we are planning to put together with the money that's been appropriated thus far ready for deployment purposes. Now, to the extent that uh, we may be fortunate enough to not have all of the active people deployed at any given time, is there a plan to, uh, for utilization of their services other than in the field to well, keep them active? We anticipate that they will train extensively even after they come back from missions because part of what we have to do is not just to find the right people with the right skills but to form them as teams depending upon circumstances. So creating those teams will be an important part of what we do even after folks deploy. Uh, but there's, it's also true that they may be available for what I'd call conflict prevention, stabilization work before a country gets out of hand. And there are, as I think you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 countries which are in the failed or failing state category. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, um, there's a great deal of work for people with these skills to do. So I expect that they'll be deployed uh, quite, quite regularly. But it's also true that in order to keep our costs down, we are keeping the numbers of active component relatively small mm -hmm. compared to the others so that when we are past these large engagements, uh, we don't have lots of people sitting around. Scale down. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jones, can you give me a current estimation of uh, when it is you'll fill all of the billets uh, in the so-called surge? And, and when I say Phil, I mean not with Department of Defense people, but with uh, in-house USAID, State, um, Department of Justice, or Ag people. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, uh, our team in Kabul identified <clears throat> a first tranche of uh, 56 critical slots that they wanted filled in June and July. Um, we are uh, some of those. Uh, some of those personnel have are already arriving, particularly several from USAID. Uh, we have hired virtually all of them at this stage. There are a couple left that, that, were, that were still back and forth with our embassy deciding on candidates. Um, and they are all in train to uh, go through training uh, of various types, which is actually several weeks of training, the, the, the package that we give them. So we expect to have all 56 in place um, in that time frame. We have a, uh, the, the balance of the uh, 420 will deploy in phases throughout the next months uh, with the final ones arriving uh, no later than March is our, is our plan. And uh, we feel confident we can fulfill that plan. But as I said, we have no hesitation to turning to other streams of hiring if, if we find some pr difficulties. 
Well, the question is more on that, but my time is up for right now. Mr. Flake, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Jones, is there a, st a status of uh, forces agreement uh, in Afghanistan at the current time? Uh, that was a problem in, uh, in Iraq. Contractors uh, didn't know what, you know, if they were immune to charges or whatever else. What, what do we have to ensure that we won't have those problems in Afghanistan? Uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, your question is the, the is question there, of is contractors. There a, is there a status of forces agreement in, in place in Afghanistan uh, at the yeah. current time that, that clarifies the role uh, of, of uh, civilian personnel, contractors? Of civilian personnel. I'd have to take that. I don't know if, David, you know the answer to that or whether we can take that back. I, 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 can, I have some general ideas, but I don't want to um, speak out of turn. David, do you? Anybody who, uh, Mr. Sedney? We, we do have a, 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 a an outstanding status of forces agreement uh, that we've uh, signed with the Afghans. Uh, and I'll have to check and get back to you on the, on the date. I think it was 2003. Uh, if you could I speak do, up just a little. We do have a, an outstanding uh, status of forces agreement that we signed, with the, which we agreed to uh, with the exchange of diplomatic notes, I believe, in 2004, in 2004 I believe. Uh, but the status of civilians under that status of forces agreement, I'm not clear on. We'd have to get back to you. All right. well, if you could do that, that would be certainly of well. interest. All right. Um, and uh, Mr. Jones, what uh, type of deployment are we talking about here? What, how long will the civilians be in theater? Um, the, the, uh, the civilians that we're assigning, we took a policy decision that we uh, are looking for the civilians to stay a minimum of one year. Um, uh, many, or some seek to extend, and that would be fine, but we'll, each one will be deployed for one year. Uh, we don't have, we actually call this a civilian increase because we don't have a plan to decrease, uh, you know, so we, we, that's why we sort of avoid the term surge because it gives the impression that this is just for a few months. Mm -hmm. Actually, we plan to continue this, this deployment and to fill those slots after one year. I'm still a little un uh, unclear, Mr. Sedney. Maybe you can clear it up in terms of, of, of where these, all of these civilians are going to come from. I know some are currently uh, full time at USAID; will simply be reassigned. Yeah. Um, others, are we talking about contractors that, that will be hired in country that will make up some of this force? Uh, yeah. What? Uh, Actually, yeah. Uh, thank you, um, uh, L Congressman Flake. Let me uh, let me clarify that. Um, we have uh, uh, special hiring authorities um, at the Department of State and at um, uh, USAID to hire temp direct U.S. direct hire employees on a temporary basis. Um, so we will use a mix of, uh, in the case of U.S. Department of State, regular foreign service officers plus individuals who have particular skills that we're hiring temporarily, and we advertise that on USA, USA Jobs and, and hire them under what's called 3161 authority. All right, Mr. Michener, uh, obviously we see the need uh, with regard to shifting economies uh, in Helmand province where a lot of the work is gonna be done. Obviously that's where a lot of the poppy production has moved to. Uh, what, how, what percentage of this 500 do you expect uh, to be deployed uh, in agriculture or agricultural experts? I know you probably want more than you're going to get, but uh, what, what do we expect and from the others as well, the composition of this? How many to, to, are, are going to be uh, legal affairs or democracy building, agriculture? Give me some sense, if you could, of, of how this breakdown is going to, going to be. I can speak to USDA's portion of agricultural right. experts, which is roughly 10 percent of the, of the number right now. But at the 421 number that's being floated, it's my understanding that's a living document that's being revisited. That number could increase depending on need. And I also want to stress that um, USDA is not the sole source of agricultural right. expertise. Yes. There would be USAID right. agricultural experts as well. All right. But that's surprising. That's a little smaller than I thought it would be in terms of the agricultural experts. Mr. Beaver, did you want to comment? Yeah, I can just add that uh, you know, we are entering into a partnership uh, with U.S. Department of Agriculture to make sure that both the public sector government functions of the agriculture sector are adequately covered along with the private sector business end of the equation and the infrastructure requirements as well. Um, 
as we, we already have some agriculture officers in country, and we will be adding at least another 16 or, or more specifically agriculture officers out of the 150. We also have breakouts for our the numbers of engineers, numbers of governance officers to work at local government levels and private sector officers, as well as uh, what we call general development officers who also can cover agriculture because they've had some background in that area. As the situation evolves, we will bring even more on board. If we find that that's what's particularly required, we will concentrate in the south and the east in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Foster, you recognize five minutes. Thank you. Um, could any of you say anything about the age distribution of the um, civilians being deployed for this effort? I mean, is that easy to characterize one way or the other? Are these a bunch of you know, um, starry-eyed kids coming out of college? Are they a bunch of retired people? Um, you know, what's the, is there any easy way to characterize that? Where would you put yourself in that crowd? What? <laughs> I don't know. I, I've retired from two careers so far, so I don't know. <laughs> If, if I could, uh, thank you, um, Congressman. Uh, w um, if I could just begin with that, I, I personally reviewed all the uh, the resumes of all those we are hiring in this first tranche, and I didn't really focus on on age, but the but the um, the experience was quite remarkable. I mean, I think, in fact, in this first tranche, I think virtually all of the candidates, at least that are being hired. Um, by the State Department through this temporary hiring authority or foreign service officers were already well known to our embassy colleagues in Kabul because they had been in Afghanistan before in some capacity. Um, a couple of, uh, you know, and, and really a range of different backgrounds, experience from former military, um, some former academics who had clearly done research in Afghanistan before, um, and then people who had been deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I doubt any were, were young and certainly all were very experienced. Okay. How, how does the size and scope of this effort compare to what NGOs might be attempting in the area? And are, are these are NGOs viewed as a, a force multiplier or an annoyance um, by, by the people um, that are having to deal with them? And are we doing everything we can to, to make maximum use of, of them? Uh, sir, I can uh, just uh, respond to that. And I can also follow on Mr. Jones' comments about the caliber of people we're bringing on board. They are very carefully scrutinized. We have very careful selection process by, uh, by teams of people at AID headquarters and the mission who look at who these people are and check their references. They are generally quite seasoned people. Uh, even if they're retired, they might still be a little starry-eyed, but, uh, but uh, they're not wet behind the ears. Uh, and uh, most of them are what we would call battle-hardened, meaning they've, they've worked in civil strife settings or in developing country settings in their own profession. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, NGOs, uh, we see a great opportunity to increase and deepen and expand our involvement with non-governmental organizations. There is a caution there, though, that uh, in both Afghanistan and Pakistan, there is a caution, though, in hitting the right balance because both of the host governments are concerned about how much attention we strengthen the government functions at all levels as well as the non-government functions. Uh, and so getting that balance right is going to be a matter of dialogue. But the NGOs are – Pakistani and Afghan NGOs are certainly very active already and willing to step up to the plate. We have to check to make sure they are accountable and that they use the money, which are given as gifts to them, of our people's money in, uh, in the way that they are intended to be used. But with that, they have the access on the ground that's needed and the insights, so we will use them even more. Do, do you share any of the um, of your support or training with the NGO personnel? Um, when a, a grantee uh, asks for it or we think it's appropriate, we will provide them certain kinds of training, particularly if they're here on the U.S. side and haven't had experience inside Afghanistan or Pakistan. But in terms of inside the country for local NGO groups, we often will have our controllers or contracts officers or technical people as part of the grant, strengthen their ability to function uh, uh, effectively. And so not only do they help us get the work done, but they're stronger as a result of it a few years later. And are there um, all Blackwater type um, private security contractors used anywhere in this effort? Um, th there are private security companies uh, in, in Afghanistan, and it's a subject of 
um, considerable scrutiny both from our government and from the government of Af Afghanistan. Uh, we don't find, you know, we would love to not have to rely on private security companies, but we, we really don't have that option in some of the areas where we have to work. Um, what we are looking to do, as, as I indicated in consultation with General Petraeus, is to work as closely as we can with our military to secure uh, the civilians or the areas in which the civilians are working in order to minimize any reliance we have to have on, on private security contracts. Okay, do you have any feeling for the percentage of the military support that you get that comes from private contractors versus um, actual armed services personnel? Any per uh, the, for the percentage, I'm sorry. Well, you said there, there wasn't, in some areas, there was not an alternative. Um, yeah. And so, but what overall for this effort? Is it 50% supported by, by private contractors or 10% or do you have any venture? Yeah, any yeah kind I'm of not estimate? sure I can put a percentage down. It's very negligible. Yeah. It, it, it's very small in the field. For a couple of, of, of very specific projects, we hire private security because our military forces are not in that region where we have to have people. But it's minimal in the field. In Kabul, um, it's more, uh, you know, where our military is not deployed um, in the same manner. It's, we, we, have, we have more reliance on, on private security contracts. But as I say, our, our goal is to minimize that. Okay, and then for actual construction projects, um, are there private contractors involved in that? For um, construction well, when, of? Yeah, well, actually, I don't know, you know, building something specific. Is that typically done through a private contractor, or, or how is that sort of stuff handled? Do you want to address that, Jim? Uh, Mr. Beaver, yes, you want to respond uh, to that? On the construction work and buildings and so on, uh, both state and AID use private construction companies, both U.S. and local and third country sometimes as subcontractors when there's international competitive bidding. Uh, in the case of security subcontractors uh, um, for the assistance program, uh, some of our uh, U.S. firms and uh, their subcontractors, uh, and in certain cases even uh, our NGOs, U.S. PVOs, have in the past or currently uh, uh, do use some security uh, uh, people in order to keep them safe, both statically and when they're on the move. Um, this is particularly important in the infrastructure area, which is where we've had the most of our casualties, particularly in Afghanistan, but even in Pakistan with CHF and the murder of Stephen Vance and his driver. Um, some of our entities in Pakistan that work under the assistance program are uh, beginning to meet with uh, our diplomatic security colleagues to end us to figure out what kind of potential uh, protection they might need uh, as, uh, as situations warrant. Thank you. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, with unanimous consent, we'd like to offer Mr. Quigley the opportunity to ask some questions. He's uh, looking to be on the committee. The House just hasn't acted yet. So, sir, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the panel. Spe specifically, as it relates to the security of the civilians, you, you've started to touch on this. Um, but with an increase civilians, there's an increase in, in risk and exposure. Uh, what is the general plan as you, as you uh, enter this next phase for protecting these civilians? It's, as you might say, a, a whole new ball game here. And how does it change our plans with private security? Um, <clears throat> the, the, the civilians were uh, in the field, deployed in the field, will be deploying out of, they'll be based on military platforms, um, either in the provisional, provincial reconstruction teams or the district support teams. Um, what we've discussed, and there's been great uh, receptivity from our, our, CENT, our CENTCOM and uh, U.S. Forces, uh, American, uh, U.S. Forces uh, components, is uh, uh, prioritizing civilian-led missions, that is where the civilians at, at each of these military platforms there will be one designated senior civilian who and propose prioritize mi missions that they need to do to get their job at, done to get out and and uh, meet with local officials um, travel in their region and uh, there's great receptivity for for our military counterparts to prioritize and sec providing security so that's our priority to take that approach to rely on, uh, on the cooperation of our U.S. military and, and not to be hiring private security. So they're 
the these additional civilians will be in military platforms, and you don't imagine having to hire additional private security at all. That's our intention. That's right. Um, now, the there are civilians. Uh, there's also a civilian increase at our embassy in in Kabul, which will obviously be um, provided security by our diplomatic security and our own security personnel. I yield back. Please. Thank you. If Mr. I could Senator, just, do you want to add something to that? I could add on the, uh, on the issue of uh, security contractors. Uh, the Department of Defense does empl employ uh, uh, security contractors for some functions uh, in Afghanistan, as it does in Iraq. Uh, currently, according to the first quarter 2009 census, uh, the Department of Defense has uh, 3,651 3, host country nationals. In other words, these are Afghans who, we, uh, who, who DOD or DOD contractors or DOD subcontractors hire to provide security for various contracts that the Department of Defense carries out. There are also 23 third country nationals and 15 U.S. Uh, U.S. coalition nationals who are employed by the Department of Defense as uh, security contractors in Afghanistan. Uh, we probably don't have to go into great detail about the uh, testimony that we've had on this committee, subcommittee, and the full committee uh, about some pretty questionable uh, activity and conduct of some of our uh, paid private contractors, particularly in the security area. And there was uh, a number of hearings and I think a number of reports done. We have to really make a determination of what's inherently governmental and what isn't. Uh, so are there any plans that either Mr. Sedney or Mr. Jones are aware of to increase the amount of security in the State Department, their own security personnel, there's a division that you have for that, or uh, Marines or other military personnel, so that at some point in the not too distant future, uh, we'll have all of those inherently governmental security aspects done uh, by people on the United States payroll, um, or uh, is there nothing happening in that area? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a, a significant portion of the increase from the State Department side in Kabul is actually an increase in security personnel. I don't have the number right in front of me, but, but that's a significant focus in order to help our people get out without reliance on, on other security. In-house security people? Yes, okay. in-house security. Assistant Mr. RSS. Sydney? Uh, at, at the current time, I'm not aware of any plans to add additional security contractors for uh, the purpose of uh, enabling uh, the civilians out into the uh, out yeah, I guess what my question areas. was not hiring more civilian contractors, but hiring fewer of them. I mean, you know, we've got people stationed all over the world here. We've got 1,000 military bases around the world. It seems striking to me that we can't have enough trained Marines and military people to take over that responsibility so that we're dealing with the Afghan population on our terms. Uh, and as General Pateas has said, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense uh, to have the sensitivity of our personnel in there doing it as opposed to a hired gun whose job is just to get people from A to B, and when they get it there, they're not really overly concerned about how they did it. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar that there's been a long uh, series of exchanges about this. Uh, the, the point I would make about the, the numbers I stre uh, that I mentioned, that these are Afghan, Afghan nationals who are security contractors for those who are providing co primarily for contractors, subcontractors, and sub-subcontractors sub of the Department of Defense. Uh, so they're not involved in the civilian uh, the security surge, and I don't I don't know of any plans that the, uh, for the security surge to inc to uh, to inc to have an increase in those amounts. But uh, I will go back and check, uh, taking acknowledgement of your concern, sir. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jones. Are you the person that's in charge of this thing writ large? I mean, are you the one that's going to uh, know how many United States and Allied civilians are out there? how they're coordinating their activity, who's doing what, uh, how many people are stationed, what are PRTs, or other provincial or district uh, places, monitoring the progress of this, monitoring how uh, Ambassador Herbst is doing, putting people through the pipeline, whether you're going to meet the goals uh, and the numbers that you need or look elsewhere. Is, is that your job? Well, let, let me, uh, w with a lot of help, <laughs> yes. Um, but if I could just describe a little bit about the structure. Uh, our Deputy Secretary of State, uh, um, uh, Jack Liu, is um, personally engaged on this issue and has uh, told us that any bottleneck, any trouble that we have in filling these positions go directly to him for his adjudication to make sure that they are opened up and he's in direct contact frequently with Under Secretary Michelle Flournoy and other senior members of the administration. So we have that element. Another element that's very important is at our embassy in Kabul. Um, are, we have, as I mentioned, four ambassadors. One ambassador, Tony Wayne, will be arriving shortly. He's responsible for assuring all of our interagency assistance is coordinated, and especially out in the field. And then Ambassador Joe Musumeli uh, is responsible for ensuring 
our interagency management is coordinated and making sure that the flow of these people is coherent and, and demand driven out to the field and that they're supplied and, uh, as well. Okay, so it's Mr. Liu, and then you, and then those four fellows that you were just talking about. Uh, we have a whole team, line. actually, sir. <laughs> There's a lot more of us, but uh, but no. But I'm I'll just saying, the the, uh, basically, will this committee want to know where to come back to, to get a run? We don't want to drag everybody back in if we don't have to, but we want yes. to go right to the source so people know the answers on this and be responsible for it. Yes, sir. So I'm looking at the right office right here. Yes, sir. Thank you on that. Mr. Beaver, one of the questions we keep having in some of the more delicate areas of Pakistan and Afghanistan as well is we put more resources in, a sizable amounts of money for redevelopment and construction and... Uh, on that basis, how are we going to uh, be accountable for that money? A lot of those areas we can't really safely send in uh, some of our civilians uh, to do that kind of accountability work to assess how the progress is going and whether the uh, work is actually being completed or not. What, what are your plans in some of those areas? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, it's an excellent question, and it's a continuing challenge for us. I, ha yeah. I, I want to be straight with you on this especially in those highly dangerous areas. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we, as we increase the number of our direct hire officers and as we get the assistance we need from either our diplomatic security, RSO, regional security officer at post, and or from U.S. military in the case of Afghanistan, uh, also uh, to be able to get our people out, we will have more of our officers out there to sort of kick the tires and make sure things are do going right. But we also have, uh, in, in both places, uh, independent monitors. We hire other firms and other groups to, over, to, to keep eyes and ears so and brains, either contractors or sometimes their cooperative agreement grantee partners who have the ability to move uh, around the area without attracting attention. And how do you assess their reliability and, and uh, their uh, honesty on that situation? Um, pretty high not completely 100% foolproof. Sometimes they miss things, either because of the timing of when they've done a visit at, on a construction project or something, um, or, or other phenomena like that in very hard to reach places. Uh, we also use our Foreign Service Nationals, which are an extremely valuable asset to the American people in these countries. Who but even there, I mean, I, I really respect the difficulty you're having here. We were in uh, Pakistan and even some of the foreign nationals have a difficult time right. getting up into the areas yep. that we're yep. doing this work. Right. So right. is there a backup plan on that? Uh, well, we also invite concurrent audit by our inspector general, who then in turn hire local auditing firms who in turn use Pushtun, for example, to get up into the areas. Uh, and, but they, the, in the case of FATA, Northwest Frontier, you have to be from those areas mm -hmm. to be credible and to be able to get around safely. Uh, so it is a challenge. We keep working at it. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, we have certain other means which we also like to in, uh, employ. Uh, for example, when U.S. military travels around, we sometimes ask them to give us feedback, especially if it's in a combat area, to give us feedback on how things are going. We don't have those uh, capabilities, of course, in Pakistan, but we're, we are, uh, we're very mindful of this, sir, and we're looking for technological assets which could help us as well. Thank you. Mr. Flake, do you have any additional questions? Just a, just a few. Ambassador Herbst, um, the PRTs, many of them are obviously run by our NATO allies. They have different uh, rules of engagement, mission limitations. How are we going to, and I know from previous testimony and from visits that uh, many of us have taken the area, there isn't very good coordination. Um, there is striking lack of coordination, it seems. Uh, how is that going to change? Uh, what what will this do, having a lot more civilians there, uh, what will it do to change the dynamic that we've seen where it's, it's, a, it's difficult to mesh our efforts with theirs? And, and would you agree with that assessment, by the way? I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer your question because while we are doing things in the field in Afghanistan and we believe coordination is very important, and we have also had some contact, a little bit of contact with other PRTs. We, we don't have any formal responsibility for it. Oh, I don't know if one of our other panelists would want to take a crack at that question. Somebody else on the panel question. answer that? Uh, Jones? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Congressman Flake. Um, obviously, coordination is a major challenge, and uh, particularly when we're dealing with multiple countries in, in multiple different sort of uh, structures and models of of, of 
field presence provisional, provincial reconstruction teams. Um, two things. Uh, let me. When we have uh, begun in Kabul fairly recently, over the last um, several weeks, a, uh, an interaction hosted by the United Nations to uh, coordinate better the civilian de um, deployments outside of Kabul, and particularly focused as an important point of entry, the Afghan government's uh, request for 650 um, technical advisors from the international and Afghan community. Um, that was a good entry point for us to open up that discussion and have it take place much more frankly and with our uh, increased uh, capacity in, in Kabul, we think we'll be better able to coordinate uh, those discussions there. I also want to point out uh, in the very important area in RC South, um, the coordination actually has been better than elsewhere in the country and has been you know, planned and coordinated from the beginning and that's where a lot of our new forces will be flowing into. Uh, we're very actively engaged with the Canadians, for example, with the, uh, the Canadians, you know, have coordination uh, conferences here that we attend in order to make sure we're linked up. What we want to move to is areas where we actually uh, train together uh, in greater quantities than we do now, sort of. Uh, but there's, you know, you identify an important issue, we're at work on it, it's getting a little better and it's particularly more effective in the South where we are very focused. Thanks. One additional question, Mr. Sedney. Is there any type of, uh, I know it's different depending on which province you're in or, or the area, but how much more of a burden is this going to place on our military uh, there? How, uh, I know with, with PRTs, in, depending on the area they're in, it, it requires a lot in terms of escorts, in terms of uh, simply being able to carry out their activities to have um, the type of military backup that is often required. Is there any kind of formula that we have that each new civilian will require this much, or is, uh, how, how, how should we worry about that? And, and is the increase in our military presence going to account for that? Um, first, is there kind of any kind of formula that we that we know of? Uh, uh, Congressman Flake, I, I don't know of any formula, my, uh, but I'll check and make sure because I don't know everything. I know it would be rough, uh, but, but I, my understanding is that the planning is for, for uh, the integration of civilians into the military effort is done uh, based on the situation in the area. So it's different whether it's in a uh, less in a less or more permissive environment and in Afghanistan, from say the Panjshir province in the north down to the provinces in the south, situations are very different. In terms of uh, will it put stress on, on the uh, additional stress on the force, uh, yes it will, but it's a stress that we welcome uh, because in order to carry out the effective counterinsurgency effort, uh, we know we need uh, this joint civil military effort. Uh, the, uh, uh, we have right now ongoing as a result of the President's uh, a new strategy, a combined civil military planning effort going on out in Kabul between uh, Ambassador Eikenberry and General McKiernan. Uh, it's a very intense look at how we integrate the civilians and the military uh, and to do that effectively. And I would add, uh, along with my colleague Mr. Beaver said, this is going to be a dynamic uh, process uh, where we are going to continue to continue to be evaluating that. Uh, once uh, we have, a ch uh, once the uh, field has developed the, civil, the integrated civil military plan, I think we'll be in a better position to answer your questions about uh, the factors that go into uh, the decisions to deploy civilians in particular areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lake. Let me leave you with one question for homework, if I might. Uh, I think uh, we probably we don't want to be bringing you back after votes. Uh, they are voting right now. So we don't want to make you come back on that. But I think it's, it's uh, something that would be helpful to this committee. President Karzai has recently complained about the current model of the pre, uh, provincial reconstruction teams. Um, he basically thinks that they're inadvertently forming parallel provincial governments. And he has great concern about bleeding off of the impact of the uh, central government. The former State Department counter-narcotics advisor, Ambassador Tom Schweik, has also uh, echoed those sentiments. He called on the United States to replace the PRT model with a model focused on decentralized developmental councils. Now, my question would be, how could we reform the PRT model, or should we reform it? If we should, how should we, to make each team more responsive to the central government, but at the same time making them responsive as they should be to the local government, and doing all of that without risking any corruption in the PRT system. 
So I'll leave that. Uh, each of you, uh, gentlemen, if you think on that, we can supply it to you in writing as well. So uh, on that and ask that you uh, get back to us on that to see if we're, we're planning to do anything. It, it could be the simple answer. You think everything's fine the way it is. Or you could put some merit to what those objections are being raised and, and how we ought to address those. I want to thank all of you for your valuable testimony here today. Uh, it really is helpful to us and our responsibilities as oversight. We'll be working with the inspectors generals uh, and your offices in the future on this. Obviously, everybody wants this to be a successful effort. Uh, and we wish you well in your jobs and your responsibilities. And again, the three gentlemen that were working with USAID that uh, we were introduced to earlier, again, we want to thank you for your service and hope you take it back to your colleagues in the field, how much their work is uh, respected and appreciated. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.